presenter is Joe Wheaton, and he is a, an assistant professor at Utah State University and a fluvial geomorphologist with over a decade of experience in river restoration. Joe runs the Eco Geomorphology and Topographic Analysis Lab uh, at Utah State, <coughs> oh, in Utah State's University's Department of Watershed Science. I got a mouthful of words there. And is a leader in the monitoring and modeling of riverine habitats and watersheds. He is the co-director of the Intermountain Center for River Rehabilitation and restoration. He worked four years in consulting engineering before completing his BS in hydrology at UC Davis, an MS in hydrologic sciences at UC Davis, and a PhD in geography at University of Southampton in the UK. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Justin. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, great. Uh, I want to thank Justin and the organizers for inviting me. Um, the title of my talk is uh, Beaver, a Restoration Liaison Between Riparian and Upland Systems. And uh, I'm not sure if this is going to work, it will. And so the title sort of alludes that I'm a fish out of water here. I am lost. Um, the, I, I study rivers, I don't study forests and upland systems. And so, um, so my perspective may be a little different. Um, and the purpose of my talk today is to share with you a different angle on restoring the West and highlight the role that a little rodent might play in that um, and uh, not just bringing us together but uh, in uh, restoring these systems. And here's a, a typical uh, incised stream in the West and here's uplands, maybe some of the places that you guys, uh, guys work and then I'm down here in the uh, playing in the mud and, you know, we draw these artificial boundaries because then we can have a Department of Watershed Sciences and a Department of Wildland Resources and it all works out and, um, and, you know, but maybe, I don't know, do we draw it a little bit differently? We have the riparian fringe zone and is that in my turf or your turf? And beaver don't really care, they don't give a damn, they build their dams and these things sort of blur these boundaries and some of the stuff that they need to build these little dams uh, they venture uh, up further on the hill slopes than uh, silly fluvial geomorphologists like myself. So um, Michael Pollock there, a colleague, thinking where exactly is that line? And another example of this, a little closer to home and just up the canyon here, uh, this is uh, our uplands, our, our riverscape. Um, we have these aspen forests, which uh, we've, we've heard a lot about. Um, and we have uh, these beaver dams, and in this case, built with a lot of those aspen. And right there, that thing is a skid trail. Um, and so it's not just in silviculture that these things get used, but uh, beaver like to use these things and take advantage of gravity to drag the aspen down and use them in their dams. Um, and this is about 100 meters that they're willing to go up the slopes. And what, uh, and so what we have here um, is yet another example of how a beaver like to blur these boundaries. And it's good because it forces us to, to talk to each other. Uh, this, um, for those of you that have been there, this is up in Spawn Creek, up Temple Fork, up the canyon. And so what I want to do uh, for the, the, the next 20 or so minutes here is uh, talk to you um, a fair bit about what beaver do, because that may be um, something we're not all as familiar with. And then talk very briefly about the state of our streams and uplands, um, adjoining uplands. Uh, and then uh, talk about this idea of using beaver as a restoration agent. And then talk about, okay, so if that's a, an appropriate tool for restoration in some context, where do we do it? And so I'll introduce you to uh, what we call the brats. And so beaver, um, they're a habitat generalist. They're highly adaptable. Uh, we find them in lakes, rivers and streams, abandoned channels on uh, floodplains and wetlands. And so we find them everywhere from boreal forests up in the north. Um, these uh, right here are all uh, individual beaver dams. Um, and uh, we find them down in the deserts of the southwest. And so they have really quite a remarkable range. And listening to Jim talk and show the, the slide that you've all seen um, uh, a million times of the uh, range of aspen. It's interesting how picky aspen are and have this enormous range and how undiscriminating these beaver are and have uh, an equally enormous range, actually an even broader range, um, but uh, just sort of a nice contrast there. So the common habitat ingredients that uh, beaver look for are pretty simple. They need water and they need wood. And so if you look at North America, um, basically, when we get up 
Um, I'm dying here with the red, okay. When we get up to, uh, in the north, we, uh, see a, we start to see a wood limitation. Uh, when you get into tundra, uh, we start to also see a wood limitation um, down the south, and then also we start to see a water limitation down here. And this is totally inaccurate. These little white spots uh, turn out not to be true at all. Um, there are beaver in those areas as well. Um, and so what do beaver eat? Well, maybe they eat a bunch of the things we're talking about trying to restore in this conference. Um, but uh, in the spring and the summer, um, they eat uh, herbaceous plants, um, and they can survive on just about uh, any sort of, uh, of, of vegetation. And then in the fall and winter, they tend to be focused more on woody plants. They do build these food caches. Now is a great time to go out and see them uh, stockpiling all this stuff so that they can come out of next spring fatter than they went in this fall. And so in the winter, uh, woody plants uh, comprise much more of their diet. And so um, an aspen, which, uh, which is a, a big focus of, of this group, is like chocolate for beaver, right? These guys love this stuff. And so beaver are uh, a classic central place forager. What beaver uh, do is they tend to build a lodge uh, near their, uh, their dam with an underwater entrance. Sometimes it'll be out in the center of the pond. And then they, um, they are going to harvest material that's relatively close. And so maybe the one thing you could certainly call me out on is, well, they're only going to go so far up into the uplands. Um, but uh, they uh, do um, have uh, preferences in, in terms of the type of woody vegetation that they go after. Um, Aspen is, is up there if it's available, but they don't need it necessarily. Um, they'll, uh, they like a lot of other uh, riparian species like willow and cottonwood and alder. Um, and then they do show preference for certain size classes of, um, of, of material. So um, most of the time they're going for stuff that's smaller and sort of 10 centimeters in diameter. And um, what we see is as they move away from the pond, um, increasingly they are more selective the further they go away. And so that picture I showed you earlier where they're going way up the hill slope, they're willing to do that because there's a lot of good chocolate up there, um, Aspen, uh, whereas if, you know, all that's up there is a bunch of sagebrush, they're less likely uh, to do that. Uh, so this is um, a, a graph here that's basically, this is some work from um, uh, John Stella and his grad student, Anna Harrison, um, where they sort of plotted out distance from pond, and what you hear, what you see here, I'll just turn all these on, are the, uh, these are different size classes, these different colors. And so this really small stuff down here, and so they, they harvest a lot of small stuff in yellow close to their dams, and then the further away that you go, they're, they're not gonna waste their time with that. Whereas, you know, some of these uh, size classes in like the two to five centimeter and five to 10 centimeter, they're willing to go fairly far from that, in this case, 50 meters. We actually see them going as far as, um, in some cases, up to 120, 130 meters away. And that has uh, an impact, obviously, on those vegetation communities. We tend to see a lot more shrubby growth. Um, and uh, what you see is beaver don't come in and clear cut these areas. All these uh, stems that are left are all, they're selective in terms of size classes, and they're all about beaver height, right? So they either cock their head this way and chew or cock their head that way and chew, and that's, that's about it. And sometimes you'll think, oh my gosh, I've seen like a really tall stump. It must be a Pleistocene beaver. Probably not. They probably just cut it during snowpack. Right? So it gave them a little bit of a stilt. Um, so beaver um, are very much like rotational crop farmers. This is that same picture from earlier. So they don't come in here and just mow the whole thing down and then the place is ruined. You can think of it, though, as a disturbance. But what they do is they, they come in, they selectively harvest these areas and then they lay at fallow for a while, and they'll move upstream or downstream and work another area, and then they'll come back and hit this area over again. And so uh, why, do they, why do they do all this stuff to the forest you guys care about? Well, they do it partly because uh, some of those things taste good, and uh, because they have to manipulate their environments to, to make a living. They build these, these dams, and they don't have to build dams. They don't build dams everywhere. We don't see beaver building dams in the Grand Canyon, even though there's actually a lot of beaver in the Grand Canyon. Uh, what we see them doing is manipulating smaller streams, and, um, and so what they are doing is building those dams to maintain deeper water levels. And they want to do that so that here's a, actually a pond that has uh, drained, and this is an entrance to a lodge. 
And so they want to maintain an underwater entrance to that lodge so that they are not at, at much risk from predation. And then they also want to have a deep enough pond so that in the places that freeze over in the winter, there can be ice cover, but it doesn't freeze all the way through. And then they can store their food caches, all those aspen bars, on the uh, bottom of their pond. Okay. And so they will typically use wood is the thing we think of most in building these dams, but they also use things like, you know, shopping carts and, uh, you know, old 57 Chevys or whatever the hell's there. They don't really mind. Um, they're, they're quite resourceful little, uh, little rodents. Um, but, but wood and mud um, and, uh, and rocks are the most common ingredients. And we tend to see them building these big um, dam complexes where they'll flood out a big area, which will kill a bunch of trees, and they'll build a bunch of dams in series. So here's one dam, two dam, three dams. And what they're doing when they do that is they're expanding their range and making it easier to bring uh, materials down into uh, that, that territory. And they'll even go as far as digging canals laterally from these systems. And so the habitat that they make, um, I won't get into the great uh, um, uh, controversy about wolves and whatnot, but um, this is uh, from that National Geographic uh, article here where, you know, the argument is you bring in predators and the predators put pressure on the, um, all the browsers and grazers and then you see some riparian recovery and the beaver coming back and this whole uh, perfect uh, little system. And so these, uh, uh, the perceived impacts of this dam building thing, that's what we're interested about from a restoration perspective and also from a climate change adaptation strategy. And so here's some of the most commonly cited uh, things. This is from a report uh, that uh, came out in 2011, and they talk about beaver dams slowing snowmelt runoff, and some even suggesting that this could be enough to compete with our declining snowpacks. Um, uh, beaver dams creating ponds, wetlands, and critical habitat for fish, amphibians, small mammals, vegetation, et cetera. And then they increase groundwater recharge, um, largely by elevating those water tables with their dams. And their dams, their dams are leaky. They're not as, you know, as, as well constructed, I guess, as some of our, our big dams. And, and sometimes we get confused about that. But the dam complexes that they build into these systems, they increase the roughness of these systems, as well as the sort of resilience of, of riparian and fluvial systems to disturbances. They also increase the amount of wood that we see in here. And if you come into sort of the the, uh, the rivers literature, um, even though we've spent years and years tearing wood out of streams because um, it's messy and might uh, cause flooding, now we're spending a bunch of you know, millions and millions of dollars dumping wood back into rivers um, because it creates complexity. And they change the timing, the delivery, and the storage of water, sediment, and nutrients with this dam building activity. So those are, those are some of the things um, that, uh, that uh, we might, might see as, as, as positive impacts of this activity. And there's no denying, too, that in some places they are an absolute pain in the ass. Um, they do love to come in and uh, clog up uh, irrigation canals, block culverts. Um, they can chop down that perfect ornamental landscape tree that you planted and you don't want them to. And so there's, um, there's also a lot of negative um, connotations associated with beaver and people are, uh, spend you know, a lot uh, trying to blow up dams and uh, Beaver just keep coming back. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on lethal trapping as well. And people have come up with ways to uh, mitigate some of these impacts and live with beaver. And I won't get into some of those, but, um, but it's worth mentioning that um, they're not, uh, we don't necessarily want them everywhere from a management perspective. And so real briefly, um, or I don't know if I'll actually go too far into the state of our adjoining uplands, because you guys understand that much better than I do, but at least the state of our streams, to give you a little context and think about beaver are really a disturbance agent to those streams and a disturbance agent to the portion of the forests and the uplands that they get into. And so this is just a, uh, some very crude summary numbers from the uh, EPA's uh, 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 weightable streams assessment where they went through and looked at the biological condition of streams, um, and so if we just focus here on the west, what we have is uh, something like 45% of the streams may be in good condition, and then something over half of them in fair or poor condition. And so we have three and a half million miles of streams and rivers in the uh, US, about 700,000 miles of those are what these guys studied in these reports. 
and about 190,000 um, in, in poor condition. And so, um, and the West, even though it's not as bad as some other parts of the country, we do have some fairly degraded habitats. Um, Utah, even though it's a dry state, we actually have 85,000 miles of uh, streams and rivers. Um, but I will admit that 81% of those are dry. Um, they're perennial or ephemeral. Um, but uh, 16,000 of those are perennial. And these, of these, there's been estimates that oh, maybe 4,000 of those, a quarter, could support beaver. Well, one of the things we should think about is, well, why did people even come to Utah in the first place? Came here to trap beaver. Um, and they, uh, and beaver much, would have been much more pervasive throughout this drainage network. And given the impacts that they have on the hydrology of these systems, that perennial drainage network would have been more extensive too. And of course, the vegetation communities that uh, slice through and dip down into those riparian areas um, would have been uh, different as well. And so, um, I'll skip this. Um, and so there's a lot of work uh, that's looking um, at how do we use uh, beaver as a restoration agent. And it's not at all new. Um, there's a lot of hype recently about this. People are pretty excited, but uh, actually, we called it conservation, but this has been done um, since the 1930s. And Idaho Department of Fish and Game in the late 40s and early 50s, um, probably because they didn't know quite what to do after World War II, I don't know, but they, um, they were basically parachuting beaver in um, into streams and rivers. And if you could read this, what it's basically saying, they're trying to... No, they don't really care about the beaver. What are they trying to do? Trying to get more fish. And so they're trying to improve fish habitat by parachuting beaver in, and they had these nifty little boxes that were supposed to miraculously open when the parachute was, you know, fell down on the ground. And I don't know if they kept numbers on how many of them actually did open, but anyway, this is, uh, this is what uh, they've done. And the logic with all this stuff is quite simple, is that you just, uh, you take nuisance beaver, and uh, you take them from places where they're clogging up canals or they're you know, cutting down your trees you don't want or flooding your basement. And uh, we take those nuisance beaver and we live trap and relocate whole families of them up into the places where we want them to do good and do their, and leverage that ecosystem engineering expertise. And um, this is great because they're dirt cheap compared to what we charge in terms of engineering fees to restore projects. And they carry their own liability insurance. Um, and so the popularity grows uh, rapidly with all this stuff. This is a Wall Street Journal article a few years back. And um, talking about ranchers um, wishing that they had more beaver. Why? Because they sub-irrigate some of the pastures and meadows. And they provide good watering areas for cattle. Give them good places, uh, not for cattle, but give good places for ranchers to fish um, as well. Uh, there's, there's efforts like this up on the Metau. Um, increasing stream complexity one beaver at a time. They've got a really long-term meat project up there in uh, Washington. Uh, you'll see bumper stickers like this. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about the impacts of beaver on fish. And this is a kind of in your face uh, sort of thing that uh, beaver taught salmon to jump. Uh, they can get upstream and down through these dams. Um, so there's a lot of positive press on this stuff. Um, in the West, we have a lot of uh, stream systems that are heavily incised. And so uh, we've been using beaver to try and restore these uh, incised streams um, that are, uh, well, that's, that was obviously late. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm repeating myself. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, I want to walk you through is just some re a real basic concept in geomorphology. This is a channel evolution model. I apologize if it's a little fuzzy. And so what this is arguing is uh, these incised streams um, that what happens is you might have historically a condition where you have an extensive riparian area, a high water table that supports that riparian vegetation, and then something happens which causes that stream to incise, and as it incises, this water table lowers. And this is something that can happen very, very rapidly, on the order of a few years to a decade. And when that happens, then it kills off all this riparian uh, vegetation, and um, over time, you get this, uh, this, this trench, which starts to widen because it can no longer keep going down. And as it widens, it builds these surfaces that become colonized by vegetation. And then, you know, over time, the seam keeps degrading and building out. And eventually, you get back to what you started with. And so, from a manager's perspective, if this is how incised streams work, this is great. Because what it says is, I don't have to do anything. I just wait. But if you look a little closer, I said this can happen very rapidly, and it can. 
Well, the, the time scale on this is, this is decades, this is centuries, this is millennia. It can take a very, very long time for that recovery to occur. And so um, when we're dealing with endangered species in these systems, uh, we may not be willing to wait that long. And so uh, Michael Pollack, who we've been doing a bunch of work with uh, from NOAA Fisheries on this, had this neat idea that, well, could we short circuit this process? And could we short circuit it with beaver? And so by short circuiting the process, instead of taking you know, uh, centuries to millennia, could we do this in a matter of, of years to decades um, and try to grade these systems back up, get more complex habitat, et cetera. So here's uh, two cartoons um, to kind of envisioning how that takes place, one with beaver by themselves and one with a little of assistance. And in this case, what happens is when you have an incision trench on that far left, uh, if you put a dam in that incision trench, uh, it floods, all the water it comes up and it's all acting on the dam, it just blows it right out. And so when that blows out, it often blows out on one side, and then that kind of kicks off some widening of that trench, which in the context of that cartoon is not a terrible thing, right? That gives us some surfaces to grow vegetation on. Then they can build dams on those, those may blow again. But over time, you get there and it's, it's sped up. In some systems, um, it, you may need to give them a helping hand. And um, this is exactly what uh, Michael and uh, a bunch of collaborators, and Nick Bowes and Chris Jordan um, have been doing out in Bridge Creek in Central Oregon is buying them a little bit of time by just putting wooden fence posts in. And these come from your lodgepole pines. Um, and uh, these are untreated fence, fence posts and they just give them a little bit more stability uh, so that those dams don't blow out on every single event but uh, last a little longer. And so they've been playing with different sorts of ways of doing this, building little fake starter dams or reinforcing existing dams or just putting in a, a row of posts and seeing if they come in and build on them and yes they do. And so I won't get into the results of this but we're spending um, a lot of time and effort trying to monitor this response so that we can see whether or not we can not just put beaver in places that uh, they could restore the system that aren't as difficult as an incised stream, but an incised stream is actually a grade those to the point of floodplain recovery. Um, and we have a lot of these in the West, and are there any BLM employees in the room? That's good, so uh, that's because it's a, uh, so there's a terrible joke that if, so I say here, we don't have a map of incised streams um, in, in the West. And there's a terrible joke that all you need to do really is take the drainage network and intersect it with BLM lands and then you have a map of incised streams in the West. <laughs> but um, Utah, ironically, has one of the most progressive beaver management plans in the country. Um, and uh, this, uh, this plan specifically relies on beaver as a restoration tool. And so um, John Shivix, the, the, the head of implementing this plan, and um, what this really points towards is some work that uh, we've been doing where, okay, I got you all excited that beaver might be you know, a good thing to do restoration, they're cheap, blah, blah, blah. Um, but where do we do this? Um, where are the places we can do this? And size streams are harder, um, there's other streams that are easier, but where? And so, well, there's maps that exist like this, and where could we use beaver? And then I would argue this is not a really useful map um, because when it boils down to it, you're going to be looking in your watershed and your stream and you want to know where can, um, where is it actually, you know, some of these things going to work. And there are habitat suitability models out there and these things um, are, uh, have a hard time. And the reason they have a hard time is because these guys are such generalists. And so they can survive just about anywhere with sufficient water and wood. And so um, uh, these things uh, that where you just have these traditional habitat suitability curves and you try and correlate something like stream slope to, you know, suitability, uh, you run these models and then beaver just go and completely defy what you told them was a good place to live. And so instead though, um, if we focus on where could they build dams, because that's actually the activity that we're interested in, um, whoops, uh, we, uh, we, we can have an easier time at this. And um, so uh, the Grand Canyon Trust and Walton Family Foundation, uh, Mary O'Brien um, and us got together and we uh, did a pilot project to build these capacity models and put this into this tool that we call BRAT, this Beaver Restoration Assessment Tool. And so the lines of evidence that we use in that are um, evidence that there's water. And we, we, we infer this off of nationally available um, national hydrologic data sets. Um, evidence of riparian vegetation to support 
dam building activity, evidence that there is um, enough adjacent vegetation, so not just stuff right down in the riparian, but those sort of chocolate bars up on the slopes of the aspens that we were talking about. And um, then we look at the flow regime, and so there are places where no matter how hard they try, at low flows, they just can't build a dam across them, like the Grand Canyon. Um, versus places where they can build a dam at low flow, but how likely is that dam to last at high flows? And so some test beds for this uh, here in Utah are the, uh, we've, we've done this in a bunch of places, but I'll just show you real quickly some stuff from the Logan and, um, and the Escalante. What this model does that we've built, this capacity model, is it takes this land fire data set, and this will tell us where, if I can get it to work, uh, where it will tell us where some of the aspen um, are, of course, and what we take, the vegetation, and we basically score it in terms of, uh, of, of its uh, suitability as a dam building material and whether or not beaver like it. And then what we have to do is we take that scored uh, vegetation map and then we map onto the drainage network what the vegetation looks like right in the riparian zone versus right outside the riparian zone. And so that uh, then we can combine and what we predict based off of just vegetation alone is the density of dams that we can support. We also combine that with a couple of other things. There's base flow stream powers. So the blue is just, they can build a dam anywhere in this particular system um, at base flow. There's, no, there's very few little uh, green or red places where it's limiting. Versus here, this is uh, the, the, uh, at floods, there's a few more places where the red areas are places the dams are likely to blow out. And we do that on the basis of stream power. And then we combine that with the original vegetation only estimates, and then we can predict areas where there shouldn't be any beaver dams, areas where you might see occasional one to four dams per kilometer, frequent five to 15, or you know, pervasive up to 40 dams per kilometer. We use a fuzzy inference system, it's way too late in the day to talk to you about that, but um, the vegetation uh, to, or, I'm sorry, but the verification of this is, is, is worth mentioning really quickly. And so what we look for are places where, so are the red zones places where we don't see any beaver dams? And so here's this example from up the canyon, Temple Fork and Spawn Creek, and we don't see any beaver dams in the areas that are predicted as not being able to support them. And we see low densities in these orange areas. So the yellow stars are beaver dams, and the white are referring to dam complexes. So there's four in this area, there's 11 in that little area. And for scale, that's a kilometer. And then the green and the blue are the, are the good stuff. And so what's good about this is here's a place, the place I showed you earlier, uh, that's pinpointing on the map that this is an area that should be able to support a ton of beaver dams. And in a little half kilometer section, we've got 11 of them. And so whereas here's a place where some dams blew out and then these guys um, up here is a place that the model said is really good and we don't see any beaver. And so what's going on there is that, um, is that then this, these dams blew out and then these beaver moved up here and in 2010 uh, there were no dams. In 2011 they built 12 dams in a, in a period of a couple of weeks, right where we predicted it. Is it because it's this great model? No, it's because there's Aspen there, okay? So it's, it's not rocket science. We can do this at a large scale and basically build confidence in uh, these predictions and we, what we see is that these higher quality areas that beaver are indeed when we look at you know, hundreds and hundreds of dams across the landscape, beaver are indeed using those. So um, I'm rambling on way too long, so I'm gonna cut to the chase here. There are things that can limit this. Uh, cows can be a culprit, but also there are ways that you can manage these landscapes uh, to have effective grazing management strategies uh, that don't limit um, the, the capacity uh, to have as many dams. And we have some ways of, of, of modeling that stuff. So uh, we are running these models for the whole state of Utah, and I'd be very curious to talk with some of you about that know something about uplands, I'm like me, um, about where that management interface is. And so the main takeaways I want you to go away with are that, that dam building activity is of benefit not just to these riparian systems that I work in, but potentially upland species too, like Aspen, because it's a disturbance agent. And um, that uh, we have some tools for, for being able to map that. So sorry for rambling on, and I will let you get to your break. There are too many people I should uh, acknowledge, but I'll leave their uh, things up there. And thank you for your attention.
I don't see any hands. So. <laughs> hey, Joe, coming from an aquatic background, this, your talk was very refreshing, a refreshing view of the forest. Okay. <laughs> My question is, how are you going to deal with, or perhaps you've already dealt with, downstream water users in these projects, as you know, these downstream irrigators freak out when they see beaver dams going in and want to remove them. Could you address that? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, fortunately, we have conservation of mass. And so, uh, so beaver, so we hear this all the time, beaver stole our, or stealing our water. And it's just not quite accurate. So what beaver do is they change the timing and delivery of that water. And they are not putting these things behind Hoover dams. They're putting these things behind leaky sieves that are pretty damn small. But if I get a whole bunch of them, I've basically got this sponge up on the, on the landscape, which instead of having a whole bunch of runoff that comes off quickly, is, will release this out slowly. So if you're a farmer that harvests all your crops in June or July, when you also have a bunch of spring runoff, that could be a problem. I don't know of many crops that are harvested then. Um, but if you're someone that uh, would rather have a little water later in the season, then it may not be a bad thing. Now, quantifying that is tricky, and, uh, and we're, we're trying to get some studies going to take a closer look at that. And it's not, there's enormous um, diversity in these things, and so it's not always going to be this really simple story. I mean, I've painted a pretty rosy picture here, and the devil in the details is there's, there's, there's a lot more going on, but doing some uh, paired basin studies to actually quantify those impacts um, I think it's exactly what is needed, but you're right. That's going to be a huge issue, and legally, there's no precedent for it yet. Okay. Thanks.